The first segment is from the perspective of those who are within the academic institutions. Uh, Tom Fisher will uh, join us from Minnesota. Terry Brown is with us from uh, State University of New York at Fredonia. And here in the room in Atlanta are uh, Paul Baker, who's a policy specialist here at uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, Amit Doshi, who's an assistant uh, librarian, uh, very much engaged in the rethinking of, um, of libraries. To set this up, I want to talk about the work uh, that we read from uh, Bill Mitchell. The first piece was written in uh, 95, the city of, city of Bits. Uh, it was written, in my view, at that particular point in time in which those things that we now take for granted, ubiquitous Wi-Fi to site but one, was just beginning to seem to be possible. It did not yet exist at that point, but there's uh, the wonderful experimentation with language and what we call those things. Uh, smartphones didn't exist, of course. That language was not there, but such arcane language that some would remember as Netscape and other kinds of obsolete um, uh, vestiges of technological past uh, were there. Fast forward 10 years uh, in placing words, he was writing about the other side of that particular event, uh, particularly from the standpoint of someone who was within the academic institution. Uh, he, was, he was at MIT at the School of Architecture, uh, very much in the forefront of the use of computers in a variety of ways within that professional discipline but also was an observer of a number of other changes that were beginning to happen in terms of the way in which the institution responded to technological options. The, the wireless grove is the piece that speaks most directly to that. Now, 10 years later, uh, I'm asking us to talk and think about what the consequences are for the future of the university. And uh, Terry, I'll call first on you. Thank you. I'll tell you a little, uh, just a little bit about where I am right now. I'm in at SUNY Fredonia, which is uh, one of 64 campuses in the State University of New York system. We are located south of Buffalo and on Lake Erie. We're the earliest uh, institutions formed in the SUNY system, formed in 1826, and part of the settling of the first frontier of the United States, kind of the uh, sending out of, of school teachers to, uh, and, and actually the, the, the school was a normal school to prepare school teachers on the frontier. In the 1940s, during the height of the expansion of American higher education, we became part of the state system and have expanded over the decades since then, adding students, adding faculty, and buildings. Beautiful, beautiful buildings, buildings designed by IMP, and uh, just recently opened up a new science center. We're adding a new arts building, and I, I say this because bricks and mortar have really been a central to our identity. Meanwhile, our enrollment peaked in 2011, and we've seen a precipitous decline in the last uh, four, four years. Our enrollment was at 5,700. We're now at 5,200 and it continues to, to look like it will be declining. It's a campus whose identity has been solely residential. We have virtually no online programs, uh, and we are in a part of the state that is losing, rapidly losing population. Industries are closing. Uh, we are in a state that's losing population. Our funding mo model is broken. Uh, we have diminishing state support and frozen tuition, and we simply cannot cover our expenses. So the students who are coming to us, we're reaching out beyond our typical recruitment area. They're more, much more diverse, coming from urban areas to come and study here. 
they have greater financial need. They have a uh, higher need for support to succeed. And uh, we haven't done a good job of keeping up with their need and our retention rates have declined. So the bottom line is that this institution has to change. And it's not, it's not a question of, of will it for us, it is how will it change? How will it adapt? So here's what we're thinking about, and it all has to happen very quickly. Two things have to happen, given the funding, the, the impossibility of, of continuing to fund a wholly residential model. One is, and, and these two things go in opposite directions, and that's what makes this a unique challenge. So one thing that this campus needs to do is it has to extend its reach beyond the traditional student in residence and go to a much broader audience, an audience in a, in, a, in a group of students who we're not serving, those who want to complete their degrees, uh, those who are, um, so adult degree completion, those who are in high school. Very recently we had a provost say here that we didn't want to go into the high schools because our experience was a residential experience. So teaching in high school was not for us. But now we find that we must do recruitment and teaching in high school. So what we're calling uh, for now Fred X uh, is going to be that entity of this institution that will deliver wholly online programs, adult degree compl completion programs, high, uh, serve high school students, and a lot of summer programs for English language learners through a third party partner that we have on campus. But at the same time that we define this digital arm and entity of our of our very residential institution the residential experience has to change fundamentally and what the name we're giving that is artisanal Fredonia. it's the high touch customized non-mechanized in, in a way uh, much more human individualized highly supportive one that uh, adds high value to the experience of living and learning on a campus that will, in that artisanal experience, the transformation of the library into a commons becomes our most important of our building projects. Uh, rather than creating, we, we had on the board a new academic building, but we've all decided that what we needed was to transform the center, which is our IMP library, into um, an academic commons to deliver the kind of artisanal experience that we think we need to um, deliver for our students. So that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. Now I'd like to call on uh, Tom Fisher. We're in a slightly different situation. Um, I mean, we're at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, one of the largest uh, R1 universities in the country. Um, and for us, um, like many uh, of the large public land grant research universities, uh, the issues really uh, are more about what is the student experience. I think that um, the question of the future of the campus is really one of um, at a time when students can get information faster, in some ways even more accurately uh, on the internet than a faculty member can deliver it, uh, and uh, take online courses and degrees without ever setting foot on a campus, the question then becomes, why do we have a campus? Uh, this has been a very disruptive technology for uh, higher education in that the traditional role of coming to a university to gain knowledge has been replaced. And um, it adds, that I think forces us to ask, you know, why have a campus? What is the experience of coming onto a campus. Um, and as we talk about that at the University of Minnesota, it is increasingly about the notion of um, doing the very things that can't be done online. So um, we see uh, higher education becoming much more about conversation than about the delivery of knowledge. Um, that it is much more about uh, flipping almost everything so that it is about the students learning from other students as much as from the faculty member. Uh, it suggests a new role for the uh, professoriate, uh, which is one about facilitation, guidance, and provocation rather than delivery of knowledge. Uh, I think that um, this is going to have uh, an enormous impact on curriculum. 
I think uh, as we're talking at our university about in many ways reorganizing the university, not around disciplines, but around questions and around challenges where uh, faculty and students will be gathering uh, and working together around some of the major uh, grand challenges, so-called, that we are all facing. And um, where students are uh, learning a discipline uh, constantly in the context of applying it. Um, the University of Minnesota is maybe a little uh, different from many other land-grant institutions because we're also in the middle of a big city. And so a lot of this as well has been about connecting students to the city. Um, so the city becomes the classroom, not the campus. Uh, and I think what comes out of that is that the campus itself is going to change. So just as the city becomes the campus, the campus becomes the city. And so increasingly, we're looking at um, bringing um, companies um, and others uh, onto campus. Um, and I think eventually we're going to start seeing campus buildings being used um, as incubators, as startups for um, companies that students and faculty are going to be launching. Um, and as places where the community is welcome and um, uh, participants in a kind of ongoing uh, learning activity. So I think that um, we will uh, have campuses in the future. We will have uh, universities in the future. I think we're going to have many fewer universities than we have now. Um, certainly, we're going to have fewer colleges than we have now. But I also think that a lot of colleges um, are going to become much more uh, focused around questions and problems rather than uh, around disciplines. In some ways, in a place like the University of Minnesota, where we have far more research centers than we have departments, that I think that we may also see uh, in the coming decades a kind of inversion. So right now, all of the money flows to colleges and departments and disciplines, and the centers um, are kind of on their own, the research centers. Um, and when you look, though, at a lot of these centers, uh, they're actually the ones that are delivering knowledge in interdisciplinary ways that are relevant to communities. And so I think we may, in fact, see a reversal of money flows in universities so that the units of the university that deliver knowledge in relevant ways to communities uh, in an interdisciplinary way will be the core of the university and the disciplines will be serving them. So we will still have disciplines, but the dominant structure will not be disciplinary. It will be applied and um, community driven. Tom, that would be a fairly uh, disruptive uh set of changes. We'll hold that thought at that point. That's a that's an extremely uh, big idea. I'd, I'd like to call on uh, Amit Doshi to come at this set of questions from the perspective of the librarian. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to speak. There's a quote by Thoreau uh, that I think that's some nice context about what's going on with libraries. And that's um, Things do not change, we change. Simple concept, but uh, many of our users, when they find out what we're doing with the library stacks, with library print collections, say, uh, why are you changing that thing? Uh, when in fact, user behavior has changed and the library is um, adapting, and in some ways, uh, predicting what's happening based on some fairly long-standing trends. Um, so the, the campus has changed, the library's changed, this evolution has happened, uh, albeit slowly. Um, the library at, at many campuses is kind of the canary in the coal mine. Uh, when there are some major shifts happening on campuses, the library is often the place as a neutral, interdisciplinary, uh, often geographically centered place uh, for experimentation and for um, new furniture styles to be tried out, for new uh, types of community to be built. Um, interesting, uh, when Tom was talking about um, grand challenges, a phrase that is actively used at the U.S. kind of science policy making 
level. And uh, it, you know, that's a phrase that you see in NSF grant applications. Um, and I think the library and certainly the, the changes that are now happening with the library uh, to some degree reflect a desire to address those grand challenges. Perhaps the greatest grand challenge of all, them all at this point is saving the planet. Uh, and sustainability is, is certainly something that, that uh, the library and the learning commons at Georgia Tech has been a um, part of our planning. The cycle of innovation is now on the order of months, not years. So things are happening much more rapidly. Um, campuses and libraries will need to get even closer to this cycle of innovation, this, um, creating what I like to call canvases rather than uh, spaces for continuous ideation, piloting, prototyping, creating spaces, systems that are continually assessed, uh, and then scrapping it and coming up with something new. Uh, it's, it's really uh, that cycle of, of rapid being driven in some ways by the tools we're using, but we're changing. And, and so I like the word canvases more than library spaces and systems, because I think it speaks to what we're trying to do with the Georgia Tech Library. Um, I also think that the future of libraries will be much more about personalization of both physical and digital spaces, and in some ways bridging the physical with the digital. Um, for example, environments which recognize your proximity based on some beacon, your mobile device, those are already happening. Um, the fact that uh, my phone will tell me I need to be at the airport in an hour and a half because I've got a flight uh, a little bit later because it's read my email and it sent me a text message. All of those things are already happening. Libraries have been nervous about this. Because libraries have a deep commitment to privacy. And, uh, and this, so this makes a lot of librarians, myself, even a little bit nervous. So privacy is a big part of this conversation that you know, there's much more to be unpacked there. But it's happening. It's, uh, our users are changing and we're changing with them. Um, from a technology perspective, university and library systems will be far more connected than they currently are. And that would, of course, be consistent with maintaining the centrality of the library and whatever its physical manifestation may well may well be going going forward. Because that um, I heard heard you speak uh, uh, some time ago that uh, at its core the library is about access to information, not uh, not keeping that. Paul, uh, I'm going to uh, turn to you at this point. Good evening. My name is Paul Baker, and I'm the Senior Director of Research and Innovation, underscore innovation, at the Center for Advanced Communications Policy here at Georgia Tech. In this case, my identity, um, because a lot of the way I look at things deals with identities, is as a member of the university community, and that is I'm a researcher, which is another ancillary, depending on your point of view, function of the university, like libraries. Uh, I kind of, at this evening, I feel a little bit like hope at the bottom of Pandora's chest. We've, we've heard some interesting people speaking. And as I'm a political scientist, I tend to frame the world in terms of policy. Uh, you know, and I take sometimes a hermeneutics approach there. You heard hermeneutics spoken, which is a lens. That is to say, how do we look at things? We look at things through perspectives, and they're personal perspectives. Uh, and since political scientists build models, what I've done is kind of thought about some key points of things that I think about when I look at universities. The first thing is in terms of lenses. That is to say, there are questions we need to step back and ask ourselves. One of the questions I have is, what is a university? You guys have used the word university, but that presumes I'm not from Mars and I happen to learn English, but I don't know what a university is. I know what the word means. I don't know what, it, what you mean by it. Conversely, we ask a normative question, what should a university be, which is different than what is a university? Who decides? Who are the stakeholders? Who has a place at the table? And that may be a complicated thing. From one viewpoint, the stakeholders are the students. From another viewpoint, and if you look at how many people are served 
the university community, it could be the employees. Or another point, which is what are the roles of the university? Um, and my notes here say uh, continuous, continuous and continuing education, that is the idea of a university that continues to encourage and foster learning in people past perhaps their time at the university. Uh, another thought is the, the, the role of the university at facilitating innovation and collaboration. If one of my roles is to facilitate education, so what does the university do? It facilitates innovation and collaboration. That is to say, aside from a direct one-on-one -on -one learning, the process of a relationship with the outside, the stakeholders outside of a university, businesses, other kinds of research or independent scholars, that if a university can facilitate a learning experience, which might be outside of a traditional classroom, thereby increasing ties with the community um, and building networks of knowledge and innovation up. Uh, now on the downside, two thoughts. Uh, for those of you who've had business training, one of the standard cases in business education is the case of railroads. What did railroads do wrong? Well, they thought of themselves as railroads, but they really were transportation companies. But they thought they were railroads. And that's, this was their failure. So my, the point I'm making is that if a university sit, thinks of itself as a place where certain designated individuals sit in front of other designated individuals and tell them things, they may well be uh, subject to the failure of railroads. That is, they think that's what they're doing in reality. That's not what they might be doing. So it's an alternative future. And finally, my thought of my model and the way I tend to think of a, a university, at least the way universities are currently being operated, is as an easy bake oven. Think about what it is. You have a fixed thing that provides certain processes. In this case, the heat and the movement through the oven is the process. You start with a set of ingredients that you mix together. You run it through the process, and at the end, you have the output, the cake, the object, or the student, as it were. Now, one of the problems is that in a fixed or procrustean bed easy-bake oven, if the, if the ingredients aren't quite in, um, in sync with the process, you could end up with an overcooked object or a raw object not ready. So this is the problem with an easy-bake oven because there's only so many settings that you can tweak. And so I think of public universities sometimes in the most rigid of manners as an easy-bake oven. When you start relaxing the parameters of the model, you don't have an easy-bake oven anymore. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, there are probably an infinite number of directions to go from the from all of the ideas that have been put on the table here. Uh, I'd like to call first on Clara, then Paige. In the Mitchell reading, he refers to the space when originally people would kind of congregate around the large server rooms in order to use their computers. And he talked about this idea of a learning community. And I kind of looked at it as a learning community based on the necessity of, I guess, location and on the, the use of technology. So I was wondering what are the new learning communities that are current today and what do you see are the communities of the future? Uh, in the library throughout its history in most universities has been a neutral place for all scholar community, a permanent space for specific community. That's one of the things that will persist. It's actually a great uh, characteristic to have in, in a place where there is so much um, and so much is happening virtually. So uh, one of the concepts for the renewed library is a scholarly place for uh, events that take place that are interdisciplinary in nature, ideally, but also where the contents of those events are recorded and archived and made accessible and metadata is added, all the things that librarians have done. So in that sense, I think there it will be a place for community, but perhaps not a place for a specific community, a permanent space for a specific community. Uh, Tom or, or Terry? Well, my response to that is that uh, higher education finds itself in this point where it was um, very similar to where it was in the 19th century, where we were still teaching
teaching Latin and Greek and the Industrial Revolution had begun and we had to adapt really quickly to a new, new forms of learning. Well, we're very much in the same place right now, which is that we are still uh, structured in a very 19th and 20th century way and the communities of learning that we've created are very much based on an old economy of mass production. In other words, the standard curriculum that we provide for students where they come through a curriculum and pop out at the end with a degree is very much in a mass production mode. And the challenge we have is that we are in a mass customization economy. So the economy has shifted beneath us and as happened in the 19th century. And so the question now is what is a learning community and a mass customization economy? And I think that uh, we don't necessarily know the answer to that, but that is the question that higher education has got to address, which is that we have got to stop uh, moving communities of students through uh, assembly line curriculum to standardize degrees and find ways to mass customize education to enable students to put together their education in a variety of ways that are relevant to them and to the new economy and figure out how we construct new kinds of communities that are mass customized. So that would be my thoughts about that. I, I, I agree with uh, everything that's been said, but the question is how do we make it happen and how do we make it affordable and accessible and not, um, elitist or uh, just out of reach and therefore because it's all happening at a time too when our the the distribution of wealth in, in our country is, is shifting everything so uh, I mean I, I know these are the right questions to be asking and I feel I, I'm a provost on a campus where I feel my job is to ask those questions, but I, I tell you, I don't have many answers right now. And I just hope that people trust, <laughs> uh, trust me um, to, to care enough to ask, try to get, the, get it right. <laughs> I think you have one of the most difficult jobs uh, in the country right now uh, from thinking about it in so many different directions, not just the technological issues of technological transformation. Paige? We recently did a homework assignment on what we believe to be what the campus is gonna be in the next 10 years. And I kind of saw it as um, right now at the University of Minnesota, we have these split courses where students are learning the information online and taking that information into the classroom. Do you believe in the next 10 years the traditional lecture classroom will be gone and turn into these collaboration spaces for this flipped learning. Can I respond to that? Paige was in my class last semester where, uh, in fact, we went nomadic. We decided that the classroom that we were in was so dreary that nobody wanted to learn there. And so we sort of crowdsourced our classroom and uh, Paige included would find uh, different spaces on campus for us to learn. Uh, there's a piece I wrote that's coming out in the Chronicle of Higher Education in a week or so about this. But um, to me, what was interesting about that was how we all remembered the content better by continually changing the location. And, um, and so this idea that place matters, that the experience matters, and that in fact it helps us learn better um, was a real revelation, at least for me. And, and so... Um, Again, I think that given the new technologies we have available to us and the ability to crowdsource and develop new kinds of social networks, the notion that, the, that education only happens in a classroom that we're assigned to, that it only happens on campus, uh, are, those are old ideas, I think. And in fact, we may have a, a better opportunity to teach and to learn by continually changing the environments within which learning occurs. And uh, this is enhanced by the digital environment. Um, so I, I do think, Paige, that um, we are going to find uh, learning happening in a much wider range of setting. And the traditional lecture hall uh, will be viewed, uh, if it isn't already, as a, 
a kind of a dinosaur from an earlier era of uh, teaching and learning. Thanks, Tom.